everybody? How are you all feeling? Good? Yeah, that's good. There's a few thumbs up. Anybody out last night? Anybody drink a little bit too much? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to try and keep it nice and fun for you guys. Um, it's so good to see so many of you turned up. Uh, I'm really chuffed, actually, because uh, I know that like there's a lot of very good talks in this time slot. So first and foremost, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Mark West, as you can see. Here's my Twitter handle. And you're going to see that Twitter handle on every single slide. So if you want to download the slides afterwards, you can go to my Twitter handle and you will see that I publicize a link to my slides. So you don't have to take any pictures unless you want to. So I'm here today to talk about how I built a smart security camera using Pi Zero and some Amazon services. And this was a hobby project. But before I go any further, I'm not, I've not been at Geekon before, so I just want to quickly say a little bit about who the heck I am. And as you may be able to hear, I'm an Englishman, but I live in uh, Oslo in Norway. This is possibly the biggest screen I've ever presented with. This is quite, quite scary. But anyway, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm an IT consultant at a Norwegian company called Buve, based in Oslo, where I live with my wife and my two children. And um, when I'm not working, I like hacking and making. So I like building stuff. And I like taking new technologies and applying them to real world problems. Because I think that's a great way of learning new skills. I mostly work with Java. I'm trying to learn JavaScript. Uh, trying and kind of succeeding in some ways, failing in others. But I'm trying to learn JavaScript. And the things that interest me most are AI, the cloud, and the Internet of Things. I've built, for example, a uh, voice-activated robot, which is powered by JavaScript. I've built drones that I can control with uh, gestures. So I, I, I like playing around, basically. And the last thing is I'm actually a member of the Norwegian Java user group. We arrange a small conference called uh, Java Zone, which is you know, like the Norwegian version of uh, Geekon, uh, which we arrange every September. So if you ever fancy a nice trip to Oslo, you can come and visit us at Java Zone. All right. So how does a talk look? Well, I've split the talk into four sections. That means if you start falling asleep in one of them, there'll be a new section, and I'll kind of you know orient you where we are in the talk. So I'm going to start by talking about motivation for this project and requirements. This was a hobby project, but it was still a project with a defined start and end, and also a project manager, which I'll come to in just a moment. Then I'll talk about how I built the first version of the camera, which is basically just a motion-activated webcam. That's pretty cheap, but it won't take me very long. And then I'm going to go on to oops, talk about how I added smart image analysis to the camera. And finally, evaluation and lessons learned. And as I mentioned before, afterwards the slides will be published on SlideShare. So let's get started. Why did I do this? Well, I've also written, actually, this is a little reminder to myself, input from stakeholder. This means that there was actually a stakeholder in this project who also was a project manager of the project. This was my wife. And my wife works as a project manager in the industry, the same industry that we work in. So you can imagine our discussions at home. I'm a developer, and she's a project manager. So I'm going to throw her under the bus a little bit today. But like, she was my primary stakeholder. And basically, the reason we built this camera, the reason I chose to build this camera was we'd had a lot of burglaries in the area where I live. So there's uh, lots of houses. Uh, around where I live, and they'd all been broken into. We were the only ones who hadn't been broken into. And we have security in the house. We have, like, you know, all kinds, the standard kind of security uh, inside the house, but we didn't have anything outside the house. And what we wanted to do was monitor our back garden. Our back garden is very secluded, and there's a big window. So it's very tempting for a burglar, I guess, to come into our back garden, and they can, they can break into a house, and nobody will even know that they're there. So we wanted an early warning system which would tell us if a guy was trying to break in. And I sat down with my wife, the project manager, and drew up some requirements. Now, I drew up the functional side. I said, we want to monitor activity in the garden. We want a warning when activity is detected. And we want a live video stream so we can just check the camera when we need to. My wife, the project manager, came with the non-functional requirements. Get it done quickly was the first. She knows me, right? She knows that if I start 
<laughs> using my evenings and my weekends to make the world's best security camera, I'm going to gold plate this project to Helen back, right? So she was like, get it done now. The second thing she said was, get it done cheaply. So she didn't want me going on eBay and spending thousands of uh, Norwegian kroner on you know, really, really cool technology to make this happen. She wanted it done cheaply. And the final thing she came with, which is actually, I think was actually a very smart point, was to make it portable, something you can move around easily. So armed with these requirements, this was my functional design. The camera will monitor activity in the garden. When it detects movement, it will send me an email with a snapshot from the, the camera. So I will know what's actually activated the camera. Pretty simple. So how did I do it? How did I do it? <clears throat> well, first I had to buy some hardware. And what I've done is I've put together a, a shopping list. I've tried, now what I've done is I've tried converting the Norwegian prices I paid into, into Polish currency. So it's an estimate. I've tried to, tried to give you an estimate of how much it would cost to buy the hardware. So the first thing is the Pi Zero. This is what the camera's built upon. Here is a Pi Zero. For those of you who can't see it at the back, if you come down later on, you can have a look. It's a tiny little Linux PC. It's exactly the same as the Raspberry Pi, but it's just a lot smaller. And it comes with lots of very, very small ports, which aren't necessarily standard. So when you buy one of these, you need, you need an SD card for the memory, you need a power adapter, but in addition, you need lots of adapters for connecting, for example, USB or HDMI and so on and so forth. So I recommend, actually, instead of just buying one of these on its own, buy an, a kit, and then you get all the pieces you need. So that, was, uh, that cost me, yeah, 127 slotty. I hope my pronunciation is correct there. Um, and then bought a camera module, and I decided to go with a Raspberry Pi camera module, which is a tiny little thing as well. Um, you could use a USB camera if you wanted to in your own project, if you have one lying around. These cameras come in two flavors. They come in a standard, like a uh, normal camera, and something called the noir. And the noir mean, is basically a camera like this that doesn't have an infrared filter. So if you combine it with an infrared light source, you can have night vision. But I just went for the standard camera to start with. Because the Raspberry Pi Zero is so small and doesn't have a standard camera port, I had to buy a special camera adapter. And then I needed a mount. I needed something to attach the camera and the Pi Zero to. And I used one of these, a Pi, uh, it's a Zero View, actually, a tiny little thing. And I'll show you, I've got a better view of it in just a second. So total cost of ownership estimate, 308. Now, whether you think that is cheap or not is very, you know, it's a very subjective thing. Um, luckily, I live in Norway, and that's not so much in the Norwegian money. So like, I managed to get it past my, my, uh, my project manager. So with this, once I had the, the hardware and put it together, that's basically what it looks like. That's a close-up. So you see on the back of the, Pi, of the Zero View, you have the Raspberry Pi mounted. The white cable is a power cable. The Raspberry Pi Zero I'm using is the Raspberry Pi Zero W, so it doesn't need a Wi-Fi adapter. It has built-in Wi-Fi. And here you also see the front view of the Zero View. And it's got two suckers, so you stick it on the inside of the window, which makes it very portable and means that you don't have to weatherproof it. You just put it on the inside of your window facing outwards. So now I had the, the hardware in place, I needed software. I remember my project manager had told me I had to do this quickly, so I decided to go for something called Motion. Anybody heard of Motion? Yeah, good, there's a few Motion heads here, brilliant. Motion is basically, um, it's open source, uh, motion detection software. So it does everything out of the box. And like, it gives you good performance in the Pi, which is the main reason I chose it, because the Pi Zero is, you know, it's restricted hardware. Motion gives you a, a built-in web server for your streaming video. Brilliant, we needed that. And how it works, it monitors the video stream. And when it detects activity, it triggers an event. And you can use that event to call a bash script for example, or a Node.js uh, script that will take a snapshot from the web camera and upload it to wherever you want it to go. Best thing about Motion is it works out of the box. You don't have to do any additional, additional uh, programming, you just configure it. So, 
I'm just going to quickly, very, very quickly, show you what it looks like. I've got two cameras running here on the stage. Let's see if I can uh, get this to work now. Now, if I just switch on mirroring, I think that's probably the best thing here. Okay. And then if I find where my... This is such a big screen, it's difficult. There you go. Look at that little <laughs> bar at the bottom there. It's very small. So if I bring up my web browser and open that up and zoom in somewhat, now you can start seeing some of it. So basically what I have here is I have Motion's own console. So from here I can actually configure cons uh, Motion to do whatever I want it to do. But basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the camera and then I'm going to change the port. Crikey, I can't see a thing here, but like, uh, oh, no, that's not good. Let me just, uh, bear with me one second. Okay, now I'm getting suddenly a port problem. Let me just try that one more time. There's the, and you can actually see, there's the view from the camera there. And it's like a very, very small, unfortunately, because I have a little bit of problem with my PC. But you guys can see that like uh, it's an image, and it's got um, some text in the bottom right-hand corner, which gives you the date and timestamp. In the bottom left-hand corner, it's got a unique identifier for the camera. And the top right-hand corner has actually got a, um, a counter which tells you how many pixels are changing from frame to frame. Can you all see that? Yeah? Okay. So back to the presentation. If I just unmirror again, just bear with me a second. We had some problems right at the start of this presentation with, um, with getting everything to be presented properly. So there we go. That's better. Right, now I'll go back to the presentation. So motion is basically pretty simple stuff. Um, oh, we don't want that either, do we? Hmm, there it is. <laughs> this is not what you want happening when you're doing the presentation. There we go. Right, so motion is pretty simple. And um, you know, I'll get it up and running very, very quickly. And this is what the emails from Motion look like. Uh, basically, a snapshot from my camera saying your security camera has detected Motion. And then you get like a nice little red box around the object that has actually triggered the activity alert. So how Motion works is what it's doing is it's monitoring the video stream, constantly monitoring the video stream. And um, it's comparing each frame with the previous frame. So in this case here, you have three consecutive frames of motion, or three images from your web camera. And the first two images are exactly the same, no difference. Everything's good. But from image two to three, somebody's come into my garden, and that has caused a certain amount of pixels to change, which are over a given threshold. And therefore, I would get an email with that third picture. Okay, so that's all motion's doing. It's just comparing pixels from frame to frame. And here's some example snapshots from last summer when I had the camera running. I had it running for four weeks while I was on holiday. The first snapshot is my neighbors in the garden watering the plants, as I would asked them to do. The second snapshot is of my neighbor's son trying to find things to steal. And the third, I think that's what he was doing anyway, because he was there every day. I have no idea what he was doing there. The third picture is of me when I got back from holiday and I went around the garden to see if the camera was still there. So, you know, it worked brilliantly. We were very, very happy. Um, you know, the camera monitors activity. It sends a warning. It has a live video stream. It was up and running in the space of seven hours it took me. Once I got the hardware delivered, to put the hardware together took me five minutes. And then I spent a lot of time downloading Motion and getting it to run and getting it configured on, uh, on uh, Raspbian. It was low cost and portable. So yeah, me and my wife were quite happy, successful project, high five. And then we started getting the false alarms from the camera. When the neighbor's cat came into our garden to go to the toilet, shall we say, I got an email. When 
clouds moved across the sky? I got an email. When shadows moved across the garden, email. When it rained and rain hit the window in front of the camera and dripped down, email. 250 emails in a bad day. <laughs> you can imagine that when you're sitting in a meeting with a customer and your, your Apple Watch is plinging constantly, telling you there's movement in your garden, you stop paying attention after a while. You actually start sending all the emails to your junk folder. And there's a problem because the camera's not effective. So I needed to find a solution to this. And the problem is, is that motion only cares about the amount of pixels changing. It doesn't care about the root cause of the pixels. So on to the next stage, adding smart image analysis. What I needed to do, I needed to have a filter between my camera and the email sending, which would say, OK, that's a picture of a cat. It's not a real alert. Or that's a person, right? send an email. And to get my wife to allow me to make this change, I had to raise a change order, which is actually a daily event in my house, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so what I did, I went to her and said that the functional requirements are wrong, or they're not specific enough. Instead of sending warning when activity is detected, I need to send a warning when human activity is detected. So I managed to get my wife to say, OK, you can look into other solutions, uh, but before you start implementing them, you have to come to me. OK, I said. I always say, OK, dear, whatever you say. So the first thing I looked at was OpenCV. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of OpenCV. OpenCV is a great library. I sound like Donald Trump there. <laughs> it's the best library. Um, but I was going to use OpenCV. I was going to actually implement face detection using OpenCV, and I was going to look for faces in my garden. So if it saw faces, then it would send me an email. But the problem is, if that person in my garden isn't looking at the camera, or they've got their face covered, face detection isn't going to work. So then I started thinking about, what well, about building my own neural network? Now, that would be fun. I thought, OK, TensorFlow. I started looking at it, I thought, TensorFlow, that, that, that'd, be, that'd, be, that'd be great. I'll build a neural network, and I'll use that to find people in the images. And then I spoke to my wife, and she said, no, 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 no. Because building a net neural network is a great project, right? It's a lot of fun. And TensorFlow gives you a lot of stuff out of the box. But to get a neural network to work properly, you need to give it good training data. You also need to understand a little bit about how neural networks work and different types of neural network. And that was going to take me time. My wife asked me to estimate how long it would take, and I was like, ah. And that was enough for her to say, no. So that was that. So I kind of like scratched my bald head for a while and tried to work out what to do. And then I actually got sick for a while. I had, to, I had, I had an operation. And then like, uh, you know, th I forgot about the project for a while. And then suddenly I saw a tweet from the mighty Aaron Gupta. He worked at Couchbase at this time. And he was at Amazon's uh, conference called uh, reInvent. And he tweeted about a new machine learning service which supported image recognition. Yes, I thought. So that's how I came to look at Amazon Web Service Recognition. So in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to switch between AWS and Amazon quite often. But I mean the same thing. AWS is Amazon Web Services. And um, recognition is one of the suites of, product, of services that I, Amazon offer, cloud-based services. And what recognition actually does is it gives you image analysis as a service, giving you a range of APIs. You can do face detection, uh, sentiment analysis, object detection. And recognition is built upon deep neural networks. So basically, this is a service that does the same thing that I wanted to do with TensorFlow. And it was launched last year in November 2016. Now, I'm not an Amazon evangelist. This is really, really important to say. I used Amazon solutions for my project, but you could, you could achieve pretty much the same thing if you used Google Vision, Microsoft Computer Vision, or Clarify. I've tested all of these against each other, and they are pretty similar. They offer pretty similar APIs, and they, for the, mo yeah, for the, for the most part, they're, pretty, they, they're as good as each other. So demo of recognition, just to give you a bit of context. So I'm going to see if I can get this uh, screen to work better this time, because I didn't like how it looked last time. It looked a bit uh, 
There is I. I'm looking for my mouse again. It's disappeared. There it is. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mirror the connected display. This should be a little bit better. Hopefully. All right. So if I just change those settings a little bit there. Oh, there we go. That's even better, isn't it? Yes, brilliant. Okay. Right. So if I look at Amazon Recognition, I'm going to go to the Amazon Web Service Console. So for those of you who have played around with uh, Amazon Web Services, you've seen this before. And um, basically, it's a console that gives you access to all of the different Amazon Web Services. And you see them all here. There's loads of them. And they're grouped into different, you know, different categories. But I'm, I'm interested in recognition. So let's look at recognition here. So I'm not going to, I'm going to not run Amazon's demo. I'm going to upload my own picture of a burglar. Okay, so I'm uploading this to Amazon Recognition now, and the picture is being processed. And when it's pro finished processing, we will get some labels on the right-hand side of the screen, which describe what Amazon Recognition sees in this picture. Now, this picture is pretty abstract, really, when you don't know context. So that's probably why Recognition thinks it might be art, or even modern art. Um, you see the confidence scores are around about 50%, so it's not very sure, really. But it does see a person. And that's quite important because it gives me a mechanism for creating a filter to stop false alarms being sent to me. It also sees this as being a portrait or maybe even a selfie. And I was kind of scratching my head for a while, working out why is this a selfie? And then I realized it's holding a selfie stick. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So Amazon recognition is, you know, it, it's a simple service. It runs quickly and it does what I need to do. Right, let's go back to my PowerPoint slides. Let's see if I can just run them as it is without changing all of the nonsense with the... Yeah, there we go. Now we've got that fixed. Brilliant. So how was I going to add recognition to my solution? Well, I have my camera, which sends emails when it detects activity. So I decided to change that. So instead of sending emails, it would pipe the picture or send the picture to the Amazon cloud. And the Amazon cloud would then have responsibility for analyzing the snapshot to find a person. And then if it found a person sending the email, simple as that. This would allow the camera just to do a fire and forget, uh, fire and forget kind of pattern. So all it would do, it would just take pictures and push them out to the cloud. It wouldn't worry about anything else. And this actually gives you an idea of the services or some of the services, the Amazon Web Services that I used. So let's step through what happens. First, the picture is uploaded. And it's uploaded to something called S3. S3 is Amazon's storage service. And pretty much like Dropbox, in fact, I think Dropbox is based on S3. At least it was. So when the picture's been uploaded, it activates a trigger, which in turn activates a workflow. The workflow is implemented as an Amazon Web Service step function. The step function does two things. First, it calls Amazon Recognition to analyze the picture. And if the picture, find, if the picture is found to be containing a person, then the step function will call the simple email service to send me an email. Pretty, pretty trivial stuff. And because of all of these components, they're distributed. They're not running in the same kind of place. They're like all over the place. So you need some kind of security to make sure that they can call each other and that they are able to call certain APIs on each other. And we use um, Identity Access Management, AWS IAM, to implement that. In addition, we are using Lambda, Lambda functions. Now, Lambda functions are so hot right now, so everyone's talking about them. But like, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Lambda functions, they're basically units of code. And uh, you can write them in Java, C Sharp, Python, um, yeah, or even Node.js. They're serverless. Again, so hot right now. Now, I don't like the word serverless, personally. I, don't think, it, I think it's a misnomer. Um, it, I prefer function as a service. 
But like how I interpret serverless, for me at least, it means that I don't have to worry about provisioning servers, I don't have to worry about scaling up and down, I don't have to worry about uptime, I don't have to worry about availability, I don't have to worry about anything. I just upload my code to Amazon's serverless environment, and then Amazon takes care of all of the infrastructure. So that's how I interpret serverless. I feel that like uh, serverless is, a, is, the wrong, is, a, is a wrong name because your code is still running on servers somewhere. It's just that you're not responsible for them. So for me, it's a bit like hosting, but there you go. Lambda functions give you high availability and a pay-as-you-go model, so you pay for what you use. You don't pay for having your code sitting in, La in Amazon's cloud. You only pay for it when it's actually executing. And what's good about Lambda functions is they give you access to the SDK, which means that you can use your Lambda functions as the glue between your other Amazon Web Services. So, a very quick demo. Now, I'm not going to sit here and write code for you today, um, but I'm just going to show you what La Lambda functions look like, just, just for reference. So, if I go and have a look at Lambda here, I'm going to go to the Lambda console in the uh, Amazon Web Services, and here we see the Lambda functions that I've written for this project. And we see that they're all written in Node.js, and that's just because I'm trying to learn JavaScript. I mean, you could just as easily write these in Java, Python, or C-sharp. If I click on one of them, and this particular Lambda function is used to send the picture to recognition. That's all it does. And if I zoom out a little bit, as I, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to learn JavaScript. So if you're a JavaScript coder, this code is probably going to make you cry. Um, apologies for that, but I don't pretend for one minute to be a JavaScript expert. So that's the code. You don't have to read through it. It's pretty boring stuff. It's just making a service call. But like you see, there's not much of it. And I think Lambda functions should be small. I don't think you should have a lot of code in Lambda functions. I, I, I think they should be small, discrete functions. What's interesting, if I zoom in here, you see that like you have a handler here, a wrapper around my code. And this kind of wrapper is needed no matter what language you're using, whether it's JavaScript, Java, you need the wrapper. You have the event object, which is for passing information in and out of your Lambda function, and you have the context object for runtime information about the context your Lambda code is running in. And finally, you have the callback uh, object. That's, that's a uh, JavaScript uh, artifact, and basically callback allows you to signal success or failure. So that's basically how a Lambda function looks. Now, what I've done here is I've written the code in the browser. And of course, that's not a good thing. Who really wants to do that in the real world, right? But like, um, what I wanted to show here was that you can do it if you want to. Another option is to actually build your code um, and uh, upload a zip file, or even like, you know, put your code on S3 and refer to it from there. Um, if you're writing Java code in Lambda Functions, then you're going to need to package it up as normal. And of course, then if, you, if you're going to package things up, then you can add all of your third party libraries and dependencies and whatnot. Another thing with uh, the console is that you're able to test your Lambda functions. So if I, here I have like uh, some test information. This is a reference to an object sitting in S3. So I'm just going to run it just to show you how that looks. So when I run it, I get a little thing up here. And then, oh, let's see, I've got an error message. That's fun. That doesn't happen very often. But you see here, I actually this is the output from the Lambda function, an error message. And here you see the logs. And like you see the stack trace. And um, all of your stuff that you pipe out to the console log will actually be saved in something called CloudWatch. So all of your code or all of your logs can be, yeah, you can go through them later by using the CloudWatch service. So that's pretty much it for lambdas. I mean, like obviously there's more to say than that, but I don't want to go into too much detail. This is just a part of how I solved my, uh, my problem. So, we have all these Lambda functions. So, the Lambda functions were used to implement both the upload trigger and some of the steps in my workflow. But we also have something called the step function. And the step function is basically something for coordinating and orchestrating your Lambda functions into a workflow or a state machine. And um, they're relatively new, launched last December. Step functions are defined uh, using JSON files. 
and display this visual workflow. So it means that you create a JSON file with your states and your transitions between the states, and you upload it, and then it gets displayed as a nice, funky visual workflow that you can't edit. And step functions, same benefits as Lambda. You know, it's serverless, high availability, scalable, pay as you go. So this is what a step function looks like when it's been uploaded. And um, you see it's quite pretty. And you know, relatively easy to read as long as your steps have uh, you know, <laughs> good names. But I'm just going to step through it and just explain how it works. So the first thing that happens is that uh, a picture will be uploaded to S3 and call this. And then that picture is then sent to Amazon Recognition using the Lambda function that you just saw. So the first step is a call to a Lambda function. The second step takes the output from that first step and evaluates the labels. So does, does, this, does the output contain person, people, human, clothing, anything that might indicate there's a person in my garden? So that's a call to a Lambda function as well. The third step is not a call to a Lambda function. That is just a decision point in my step function, which says, OK, is there a person in the picture? Do I need to send an email? And if there is, it will send an email. It will call a Lambda function that will send an email using the simple email service. And finally, we archive all the pictures because it's nice to see all of our false alarms and real alarms, you know, so you can go through them afterwards and see if everything's been working OK. Oh, yeah, I forgot the uh, error handler. You always need the error handler in case there's any kind of unchecked exceptions. So my error handler will actually send me an email if anything pops up that I haven't thought of. So that's basically it. So what I'm going to try and do now is a little demo for you of the camera. And, and show, you, show you also how the step functions work. So if I can just open up my camera, now I can actually see everything, because before it was horrible. I couldn't make anything out. OK, this is actually interesting, because this, um, this is the Pi Noir camera. I've also got a standard Pi camera running, so I can show you both of them. If I run open it here. So you can actually compare and contrast the pictures that come from, oh, that's a bit zoomed in. There you go. So what's quite interesting about these is you see that like the Pi Noir has like a bit of a kind of discoloration because it has no IR filter. Whereas the standard camera is more like what we see, right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly switch that camera on or switch the motion detection on using the motion console that I showed you just a moment before. Start that, right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try and trigger the camera by walking past it. In fact, what I can do is I can show you both cameras so you can see how it looks when I walk past. Maybe that would be interesting for you all. So if I just zoom this out a little bit, that one there, and this one here. There we go. It's a little bit smaller. So you can see it. I think it's quite interesting to see how these two cameras compare and con you know, when you actually have real video going through them. So now you can see both cameras. And what you need to be looking out for, when I walk past the camera now, you need to be looking at this number in the top right-hand corner. Because that number shows you how many pixels are changing from, from, uh, from frame to frame. So now I'm going to go in and just like come in. And hopefully, I will pop up in both these cameras. There I am. Bald man trying to break into your garden. And you see the pixel counters are going crazy. And that means that like it's detected motion. So now what's happening now is it's taking snapshots and it's uploading them to S3. And once they're uploaded to S3, they will actually be uh, yeah, processed by the step function. I'm just checking here. Yeah, I think they're uploaded. So if we go to the step function now, I'll show you the step function console. And then we can see how the step functions were triggered, how they processed these images. All right, let's see, step functions. Just wait for that to come. Right. So hopefully, all right, so now we've got some step functions that have been activated here. And they have just been activated. So if I look at one of those, let's see if we can find one that actually has a positive results. OK, so what I'm showing you here, actually, is um, the step function console gives you the possibility to check all of your executions, all your step function executions, so you can go through every single one. 
and see how it's worked. And here we see the, um, the step function that I defined that I showed you just a moment ago. All the green steps are the ones that have been executed. And then on the right-hand side, you can actually find the input and the output to each step in the step function. So what we can see here is that the, the, the step function was called, I'll maybe make that just a little bit bigger. The step function was called with the input here. And this is a reference to the image that was uploaded. So then the first step was called, which is the lambda function I showed you. The input was the, the image information. And the output was ooh, glitter. There's a bunch of labels. So it, it got glitter first, glitter, light, license, text, face, uh, portrait, and so on and so forth. So it, that was the output from recognition. So then the next step was called. And the input to that step was the labels from the first step. The output from the second step was setting the alert flag to true, which says, oh, there's a person here. So then the make alert decision step says, all right, we're going to send an email. Email is sent. And finally, the image is archived. Now, if I go to my email, I should see that I'm getting some emails from the cameras. Here we go. So for example, if I click on this one here, here we get like some labels. And there I am. And if I look at this one, maybe this is a different camera. Yeah. And here's the picture from the, the standard camera. So I know a lot of burglars don't come in your garden and start doing this. But like, it's just a demonstration of uh, how things work. Now, of course, how do you know that it doesn't always send emails? Like, if I put this in front of the camera, will it send an email? Here I have like, my, uh, my test rig on my test device, which I buy for my daughter. It's a dinosaur. So now you're going to see how they make the high-tech Hollywood movies. Rawr, rawr. Hopefully, come. there he is. Rawr. Run for your lives. There you go. Right, so the same thing's happening now. Pictures are being generated, uploaded to the interweb, to S3, where they'll be processed by the step function. And just wait for the uploading to finish. Basically, I'm SSHing to the Raspberry Pi so I can see the process, how it's working. And right, it's finished. So if I go back to my step function console, which I had uh, up just a moment ago, there it is. And I look at all of my step function executions. I should be able to find one. Yeah, so here you see that the email, the send notification hasn't been called. So what's happened first? The picture's been uploaded and recognition's been called. And here we have license plates. Mail is that, it's looking at that. Yeah, okay, license plate. There's, a, there's a, actually a, an exit sign. I think recognition thinks it's not a license plate. Flora, blossom, petal. It hasn't got a clue, has it really? But the most important thing is it hasn't seen a person. So the next step then sets the alert flag to false which means I don't get an email. So that's basically how step functions and the camera works. That's a demonstration of how everything hangs together. Right, so back to the presentation. OK, so what did we learn? Or what did I learn, should I say? Well, the most important thing was the evaluation of the project first. You know, I mean, I have a happy project manager at home now. Managed to de deliver everything. I'm going to talk about the costs of using Amazon Web Service in just a moment, but like uh, the, the costs are very much acceptable. And recognition is great. You know, I've had a lot of fun playing with it. Um, the positive side is it gives you consistent results. When you upload the same picture again and again and again, you get the same results back. So you, you know, it's very consistent. And you get good results from partial images. I have actually some examples where I've walked past the camera you know, and the, the, the image that's been uploaded hasn't included my head or my arms, just my body. And the camera still managed to see that that was a person. And it also handles poor quality pictures. This one here, this is an example. Um, yeah, this picture here was actually generated by the camera one night. It's um, based on a reflection uh, from my living room window. And it's me. And recognition said that that was a person with a 99.14% confidence score. That's pretty good. And the best thing about using recognition is there's no more false alarms. I don't get any false alarms anymore. On the negative side, it's a black box. So you don't know what 
labels you're going to get out of it. You need to play with it for a while to work out what kind of labels you're going to get out for a given picture. And you can't give feedback. So when recognition gets it wrong, you can't say, hey, you know, you didn't see a person there. You know, you, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking about uh, Google Translate, for example. When Google Translate gets it wrong, you're able to give it feedback. You can't do that with recognition. Recognition, as with all image analysis as a service solution, struggles with noisy pictures. So this picture here of my daughter on a rock in the Norwegian woods, you can't see her. But neither can Google's or Microsoft versions or even uh, clarify versions of the same kind of you know, API or the same kind of service, they can't find a person either. Or they couldn't when I tested this a couple of months back. But I'm sure they're improving all the time. The other thing about recognition is the results are only good as the pictures you upload. If you upload bad pictures, the results are going to be bad, right? So when you're creating this kind of solution, you need to think a little bit about how you're going to upload the pictures. Which pictures are you going to upload? And I just want to go a little bit back to how motion works. We talked about motion earlier on, which is used for generating the snapshots. And when motion detects activity, it sets up an event with a start and an end. And that event has a timeline with a lot of pictures. And the question is, which one of these pictures should we upload to recognition? Which one is going to give us the best chance of a, you know, a successful match? Are we going to upload the picture with, for example, the most pixels changed? Or are we going to upload the picture with the most central activity? Or are we going to up just upload all of them? You know, th these are different strategies. Uploading one snapshot, of course, costs less. Less calls for Amazon Stack, but potentially a lower hit rate. On the other hand, you've got higher cost of uploading lots of pictures with a higher hit rate. So you have to make a choice. And luckily, Motion is highly configurable, so you can actually you know, tweak it quite a lot to, to get your desired results. A quick, a, bit, a, a quick word about Amazon Web Services. I've never used Amazon Web Services before this project, right? Never. So I had to kind of get started with this quite quickly. And I used a couple of days in the, uh, in the break between Christmas and New Year to do it. It took me two days. Um, I found AWS really easy to get started with, good documentation, lots of stuff on Stack Overflow, and lots of reference architectures. One thing is quite interesting. My, my project, when I created it in December, there wasn't any reference architecture for a similar project available on Amazon's site. But in around about March, they came with their own reference architecture, which solves a similar problem to the one I've solved here. So you know, they're, they're, they're very good at coming with reference architectures for you know, common use cases. AWS has a large ecosystem, lots of services, and it's serverless, of course. So hot right now, get it on your CV, and you'll get rung up by loads of recruiters. Downside of using AWS, it's not free. You have to pay. There's so many services. When you're getting started, it's kind of like you can't see the wood for the trees. Step functions need a graphical editor, because you write a JSON file, upload it. That's kind of painful, because you, you know, when you're writing JSON, you can make mistakes all the time, and it's very frustrating. And of course, when using any infrastructure as a service solution, there's a big potential for vendor lock-in, unless you're able to somehow separate your business logic from your infrastructure logic. Costs. This was a question. Um, I've been running the camera now for quite a while. In March, I had two cameras running in parallel, and I ran 8,000 pictures through the solution. And the costs? was a dollar, just over a dollar, one dollar, seven cents. So I was quite pleased with that. But then I thought, what happens next year when the free tier runs out? Now, the free tier gives you, it's, it's basically something you get when you sign up to Amazon Web Services as a developer, and you get a year uh, worth of rebates or, or cheap. You know, you basically, you get a lot of free stuff for the first year. But then after that first year, you start paying what everybody else pays. So I did a little calculation to work out how much it would cost a month if I had around about 8,000 pictures running through the solution. And it, cost, it would cost about $8, according to my, my guesses. And um, most of those costs are for the step functions and Amazon recognition, because they're both new services and they come as a premium. Question that comes every time I hold this presentation. Did you catch any criminals? And the answer is no. But 
This is true. On Wednesday evening, somebody sent me an email. A guy in California sent me an email saying, oh, I uh, saw your project and somebody had broken into my apartment a few weeks back. So I built a camera just like yours and I put it in my apartment and then somebody tried to break into my apartment. And I asked the guy for more information. He told me apparently what had happened. He had actually got an email while he was in a, he was, uh, in a lecture at university saying somebody was trying to break into his house. So he called the police and gave them the web address to the streaming server and sent them the emails that he got from my solution. And they went to his house and they caught the burglar in the act and they're gonna use the, cam the, the, the documentation from the camera as evidence in court. Yes. Isn't that cool? I was so pleased because up to now, my camera has only <laughs> managed to detect children in my garden. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really quite pleased with that. So that was, that was very, very cool. A bonus, this is just a bonus because I've still got five minutes left, so very, very quick bonus. Anybody here using S3? There's a few hands going up, that's brilliant. Anybody using S3 for hosting static websites? A couple, yeah? Because this is something I found out, S3 isn't just for storing objects. You can actually, you can actually host websites from it. So I actually, I needed a report that would give me all of my false alarms so I could look at them every day and see, you know, okay, is my camera working properly? Because false alarms can still have in interesting information even though you don't get an email about them. So I created a report, a uh, Lambda function actually, that uh, runs every day, that takes all of the false alarms and creates a HTML report. And that's just hosted on S3 as a static website. Uh, so it's you know, a nice little bonus for you. If you want to play around with things like this, you, know, you, can, you can actually host websites, generate websites on S3 using Lambda functions and host them. So, I'm pretty much done now. If you'd like to know more, I'm going to be putting my, web, my slides out on uh, SlideShare after this talk. I will tweet them from my Twitter handle, but I will also add, add the hashtag, re, um, hashtag uh, geekon, so you can find it as long as you check the hashtag. Um, I've written a blog about how I made this camera, and also the code is all on GitHub. So it's uh, with, along with instructions for getting things set up, and quite a few people have actually followed these instructions, so they do work. Other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming today, and thank you very much for listening. There's a question, yeah, there's somebody running around with microphone, I think, if anybody wants to ask any questions. Anybody? anybody? Oh, there's a chap over there. Yeah, hi. Hello. So, uh, did you manage to filter out the cat eventually? Yeah, no, the cat was, yeah, because the cats, um, the pictures of the cats don't contain a person. Yeah, so sure. I, I don't get any of those. And, uh, so I have a question. Why? Uh, imagine the thief goes down on the floor. <laughs> like does this? Yeah, exactly. With a with a cat mask on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually. <true. laughs> you would found the work? floor. <laughs> would it work? I. You know that would be quite interesting. Um, I don't. I'm not. Sh I'm not so. I'm not sure. But like, um, if you would like to dress up as a cat, we can test it now. <laughs> You can try, go on. <laughs> yeah, it'll be Geekon 2018, I'll be back. Of course, that I will be back too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, I have. Yes? Uh, mm, so, uh, I understand, f thanks to AWS, you managed to filter out the false positives, right? Yeah. Uh, but you still have to run through AWS all the images that, you know, that, uh, that detected some movement, right? Yeah. Aren't you concerned that in case of some, I don't know, some drastic event, like lots of, like herd of cats, you know, arrives or, or oh, yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. birds, and then you have to run lots of images for AWS, that, that increase well, your, co your costs my uh, drastically. Have you any safety net for that? Uh, that that's a very, very good question. Um, what I, <laughs> I haven't got anything specifically implemented to avoid that, but like you can avoid it by, there's different ways you can avoid it. You could like, um, you could switch, because, Motion will generate snapshots depending on how many pixels change from frame to frame. So you can actually turn that up if you want to. So you would only take pictures when somebody was very, very close to the camera, if you see what I mean. Um, but like also, my garden is very, very quiet. 
That's my use case. If you, would, if you had this camera on a busy street, it would cost a lot of money because you'd be generating lots of traffic, right? But in my garden, which is pretty dead, it's completely okay. But I mean, it's, a very good, it's a very good point. You know, if your use case requires lots and lots of pictures, it's going to cost you more money. Okay? Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I've got a question. Uh, I know that uh, OpenCV has built in uh, features for human de 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 detection. Have mm. you used this? Have you ever... Uh, what was this, what you were talking about, sorry? Uh, OpenCV, uh, the, the library, the vision li library you, uh, you OpenCV. show. OpenCV? Yeah. No, I mean, like, um, the reason I... Um, the reason I moved on from OpenCV was really because I was looking for quick fixes because I was under pressure from my project manager. So I, I found like you know I found that I could do facial analysis very quickly with OpenCV without doing a lot of effort. And then when I found out that like facial analysis wouldn't work, then I had to find something else quickly. So I was working for options very very quickly because my wife was just sitting there going, "I'm not paying you loads of money for this." So yeah, that was my challenge. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, I think we're all done. Well, thank you once again for coming. And if you want to find me, oh no, there's another. Sorry, there was another question uh, there. Hi, I was wondering. Uh, so, in the end, which picture you're sending to AWS? The best one, the first one, or the? I send I send multiple pictures. Multiple. Yeah, because I find that it's like throwing mud at a wall. Uh, only some of it will stick. So only some of the pictures that are taken by emotion are good enough to find a person. If I run past the cameras. It might be that like some of the pictures are blurry or one picture may just have my foot. You know, so it's better just to send them all. Mm -hmm. So in the end it is a photo recognition or a movie recognition? No, it's photo because it's it's analyzing individual frames. And what I've done is I've 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 configured motion so that like it's not sending like uh, it's not sending a video. You know, it's not sending like twenty two images per second. It's sending like maybe one image every two seconds. Mm -hmm. And have you ever wondered about, uh, I don't know, maybe a banana pie or something um, a bit stronger than? Yeah, pie I mean, zero? you could do. The, the reason why I went for the the, the Raspberry Pi Zero is because it, it, you know it's it's very small and portable. But yeah, you could use a more powerful, uh, more powerful hardware, and you get better results. You could also find a better camera, you know, a, a more powerful camera, if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But like um, the the basic, whatever camera you use, you can still send it through recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thanks once again uh, for coming. And if, you want any, if you've got any questions, you can find me on Twitter or I'm going to be around the rest of the day. So thanks once again. Cheers. <laughs>